do introduce the chairpersons. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nikhil and uh, and uh, Ankur Hospital team for giving me the opportunity to moderate the session. Uh, today we have a very interesting uh, topic: uh, the Hutchinson's high flow nasal cannula, the physiology and current current concepts. And it will be presented by Dr. Abhinav. Uh, Dr. Abhinav is uh, working as a consultant, pediatric intensivist, Ankur Hospital, Hyderabad. He did his fellowship from uh, in pediatric critical care from Ramachandra Medical College, Chennai, and he received the best original paper presentation in the pediatric infectious disease conference in October 2017, and he has uh, many publication in uh, in index journal. And we have two uh, experienced chairperson for uh, sharing the session. Uh, first, Dr. Karthik Narayanan, uh, sir. Karthik Narayanan is a senior consultant, Rainbow Hospital. Hospital Chennai, and he published many papers in both national and international peer-reviewed journals. And he received Best Young Investigator Award in 2015 in the VAD Congress of Critical Care. And we had also Dr. Uh, also have another uh, eminent chairperson, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Professor Donna Franklin. Uh, Madam is a uh, pediatric research fellow and uh, a registered nurse with more than 30 years uh, both clinical and research experience. Uh, her research uh, is primarily focused on the investigating the various oxygen uh, delivery methods, and uh, she is having many uh, publication in, in peer-reviewed journals, including a landmark paper in LEGM, and she has also received most outstanding national Australian alumni of the year 2018. So I welcome you all. Okay, I hand over now to Dr. Karthik Narayanan for brief introduction of the topic and further proceedings. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and good afternoon to uh, Professor Franklin, as well as Muthu, and Dr. Nikhil, as well as Abhinav. It's a very important topic because we all know that uh, uh, the days of uh, failure of oxygenation with a simple flow oxygen and then intubation and ventilation is the only options are gone. And we have multiple other new non-invasive modes of respiratory supports which are emerging and the newest one in this is high flow nasal cannula and uh, it is slowly its indications are widening and as uh, things go on the the way we, we started to use high flow nasal cannula is increasing day by day it started with uh, bronchiolitis and now we are using it for various other supports but still when it comes to evidence, evidence needs to be generated. There are discrepancies in evidence for one condition, much more evidence is available than the other conditions which people have started to use high flow nasal cannula. So today's discussion is going to be, uh, it, it is a very important and we are going to hear from experts like uh, Professor Franklin, as well as we are going to go into the complete literature review of what is available on high flow nasal cannula. So I would uh, like to, uh, introduce Dr. Abhinav and I would uh, want him to start the session so that we can go into the discussion further. Thank you. So good afternoon one and all. Uh, at this outset, uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Donna, uh, Dr. Karthik Narayanan sir and Dr. Motu Chidambaram for sparing their valuable time to share this session. So let's all uh, begin the talk. Uh, just a second, I'll start in, uh, in a second. I'm not able to share the screen.
సాక కాపీ చేయడ కోసం ఏదైనా కీ ప్రెస్ చేయండి హలో సర్ ఇస్ దిస్ ఇస్ ది స్క్రీన్ సీన్ సర్ now it's visible you can see it sir now it's visible now it's visible hello now it is visible dr abhi now so is it audible yes yes ah, yes, yes yes okay uh, let's all begin the talk so today's topic is high flow nasal cannula uh, high flow nasal cannula uh, in the last decade particularly has gained widespread popularity and is being used across all the ages in the intensive care units so the objectives of today's talk are first we'll have some introduction uh, then we shall look into some mechanisms of action then we we'll look into some indications and contraindications and the type of hfnc systems available and then the initial settings and the weaning protocols and the complications of hfnc and then the evidences regarding the use of hfnc and in the end we'll have a q and a session so as we all know traditionally oxygen delivery systems are divided into low flow and high flow systems so currently there is no single simple definition for uh, high flow systems generally high flow systems are def uh, defined as those that generate flows which uh, meet or even exceed the patient's inspiratory demands so hfnc is a type of high flow system so hhhfnc known as heated humidified high flow nasal cannula so it is a specialized machine which draws gas heats it up to 37 degrees celsius with 100% relative humidity and delivers fio2s of 21 to 100% up to flow rates of 60 liters per minute in this machine the flow and fio2 are preset by the clinician and can be titrated based on the patient requirements remember hfnc is just not a standard cannula which is turned up to high flow rates so how does it act so hfnc exerts its beneficial effects by providing respiratory support and by causing hydration of the airways there are three mechanisms by which it provides respiratory support first it provides flows above the patient's peak inspiratory demands and reduces the oxygen dilution thereby delivering higher fio2s will lead to improved oxygenation secondly hfnc washes out the carbon dioxide in the oropharyngeal dead space and enriches with oxygen resulting in better oxygenation and ventilation thirdly hfnc helps in splinting the airways open and by virtue of its flow generates some amount of positive distending pressure which prevents the alveolar collapse by maintaining the frc so this slide uh, high, this this slide shows dead space washout as one of the key mechanisms uh, which has been highlighted in some of the recent studies so moller et al studied the effect of nasal high flow and dead space clearance this study by moller et al uh, hypothesized uh, formulated a hypothesis that high flow in a dose dependent manner clears dead space from upper airway and decreases co2 rebreathing this slide again emphasizes about dead space washout uh, you can see here the continuous high flow oxygen washes out the upper airways and it avoids rebreathing of carbon dioxide and thereby decreasing the an anatomic dead space uh, these are the images from the moller et al study so these are lateral gamma camera images which are overlaid on coronal mri these images illustrate that nasal high flow of 45 liters per minute causes faster clearance of dead space from upper airways as compared to controls without high flow highlighting the washout effect of hfnc now let us look into the concept of oxygen dilution so most of the books mention that 1 liter per minute oxygen administered by cannula will give 4% fio2 above the room air so if we administer 1 liter per minute through nasal cannula the fio2 is delivered at 25% 2 liters the fio2 is delivered of 29% and 4 liters the fio2 is delivered at 37% so this is generally referred to as 1 is to 4 rule so now let's see what is oxygen dilution take for example uh, this is a 60 kg adult who 
uh, who is having respiratory distress and who is breathing at 21, 20 liters per minute at FiO2 of 21% in room air. And because this, uh, and if this patient is started on uh, nasal cannula at six liters per minute, so as per the one is to four rule, six liters per minute nasal cannula will deliver 45% of FiO2. But what is the actual FiO2 delivered to the trachea? So here we can see that uh, by providing six liters per minute through nasal cannula, we are not able to uh, reach the patient's inspiratory demand. So here, the FiO2 effectively which reaches trachea will be closer to 21%, but not 45%. So this phenomenon is known as oxygen dilution. And this will occur if we don't meet or exceed the patient's inspiratory demands. Suppose if the same patient is started on HFNC at 60 liters per minute and FiO2 of 45%, here we can see that the 60 liters per minute flow, we are able to exceed the patient's inspiratory demand and thereby the FiO2s which will be delivered will be closer to 45% rather than the 21% seen in the previous slide. So effectively, high flow nasal cannula decreases the oxygen dilution, thereby increasing the FiO2s delivered to the trachea leading to improvement in oxygenation. One more important action is the effect of HFNC and um, provision of positive distending pressure. However, this matter has been a great controversy. There have been various studies uh, which have not conclusively proven the actual number of PEEP which is delivered through HFNC. So the PEEP generation depends upon factors like size of the patient, uh, flows, and also open versus closed mouth breathing. Some studies uh, by Aurora B. et al. have suggested limited pressure delivery as measured in pharynx and esophagus ranging from two to four centimeters, both in children and adult. A recent study by Riara et al. showed that HFNC use increased end expiratory lung impedance, which in turn increases FRC. So this was a study which was published in British Journal of Anesthesia, uh, British Journal of Anesthesia by Corley et al. So this study proved that HFNC uh, increases pharyngeal airway pressures and also it increases end expiratory lung volume, thereby maintaining the FRC and preventing alveolar collapse in post cardiac surgical patients. There was another study by Groves et al. Uh, this was an adult study which was published in 2007, which showed that HFNC generates a positive pressure of seven centimeter H2O at 60 liters per minute. In this slide, we see a study uh, published by Parke et al, which studied the effect of high flow on airway pressures. The results of this study showed that there's a positive linear relationship between flow and the pressure. The airway pressure was significantly greater in mouth closed position than the open position. So uh, we can say that though we are not sure with respect to the exact numbers, HFNC does provide some peep like effect, uh, preventing alveolar collapse, maintaining FRC, and thereby leading to increased in work of leading to decreased work of breathing. Other than respiratory support, airway hydration is another important way by which ex HFNC exerts its effect. By virtue of heating and humidification, it causes conditioning of inspired gases, thereby facilitating comfortable delivery of high flows and improves the pulmonary complaints. It also decreases airway resistance and impro improves the quality of secretions, thereby improving the mucociliary clearance and hence decreasing the work of breathing. Thus, effectively, it results in improved tolerance and comfort. So this, high, this slide high, uh, summarizes the mechanism of action. So the mechanisms can be uh, remembered by a simple mnemonic, which is high flow. So H stands for heating and humidification. I stands for flows exceeding the inspiratory demands. F stands for maintaining the FRC by PEEP effect. L is lighter and easily tol tolerable than CPAP or BiPAP machine. O stands, it reduces oxygen dilution, thereby uh, generating higher FiO2s. 
and W stands for dead space washout. So the mnemonic is high flow and this is easy to remember. So now uh, let's look into some of the indications, look into some of the indications. So it can be used in mild to moderate respiratory distress due to asthma, bronchiolitis and pneumonia. It can be used uh, in post extubation respiratory support. Uh, HFNC can also be used for weaning from mild CPAP or BiPAP. So it is also it is also found to be uh, effective in post-op cardiac surgical patients and to facilitate interfacility transfer. So contraindications. It is contraindicated in respiratory failure and in complete upper airway obstruction, severe hemodynamic instability, uncontrolled vomiting, and copious upper GI bleeds, and in any cases uh, of trauma or surgery to nose and nasopharynx. So uh, this is a general setup of HFNC. You can see here, there's a flow meter along with air oxygen blender, and there's a heated inspiratory circuit with a nasal cannula and an active humidifier with a sterile bag. So there are uh, two companies uh, which are manufacturing HFNC machines. One is a Vapotherm, then the other one is Fisher & Packel, which offers two machines. One is the OptiFlow and the other one is Airwo. So this is the commonly used HFNC, uh, HFNC machine in our PSA units, uh, which is manufactured by Fisher & Packel, it's Airvo 2. So when initiating on HFNC, the interface, that is the choice of nasal cannula and its size is very important. So the nasal cannula, which we select, should not be larger than 50% of diameter of the nase to ensure adequate gas flows and also to avoid overpressure phenomena and air leaks. So here in this slide, uh, each company, uh, each company actually manufactures different nasal cannulas of various sizes, ranging from uh, various sizes, which is suitable for a premature neonate to an adult. And each of them is designed to provide a specific maximum flow. So how to initiate HFNC? There are two things to be said. One is the flow and the FiO2 which are set by the clinician itself, flows. So as such, there is no consensus on dosing of flows and protocols vary widely. Usually majority of the units start with an initial flow of two liters per kg for the first 10 kgs and then additional 0.5 liters per kg for the each 10 kg above 10 kgs. Various studies have shown that flows greater than two liter per kg per minute do not show additional benefit. When, uh, when setting FiO2, we can uh, initially start anywhere between 50 to 60% and then titrate rapidly to achieve target saturations of greater than 92%. So once the patient is started on HFNC, monitoring is very crucial. The parameters to be monitored are heart rate, respiratory rate, airway patency, FiO2 requirements, consciousness, and blood pressure. So as I told, monitoring is very crucial. So HFNC responders show improvement in heart rate, respiratory rate, work of breathing, gas exchange, and decrease and have decremental FAO2 requirements to less than 40, usually within 60 to 120 minutes of initiation of therapy. Those who remain static or worsen further require uh, escalation to higher forms of non-invasive or invasive ventilation. And these are referred to as HFNC failures or HFNC non-responders. So are there any predictors of HFNC failure? So in this slide, uh, this is a study by Kelly G.S. et al., uh, which showed that higher venous PCO2 of greater than 50 mmHg, lower venous pH, and higher respiratory rate at triage prior to initiation of HFNC were found to be independently associated with HFNC failure So another study by Mayfield S. et al. showed that absence of normalization of heart rate, respiratory rate, and failure of FiO2 to fall below 50% in the first one to two hours predicted HFNC failure. High pre-therapy PCO2 levels and failure of normalization of respiratory rate predicted need for intubation in bronchiolitis in a study by Abbott P. A. et al. Here in this slide, 
uh, we are seeing a study which was conducted by Roca et al. Uh, this study was done to validate an index called ROCKS index, uh, which can predict success or failure of HFNC. So ROCKS index is calculated with the formula SpO2 by FiO2 by respiratory rate. So this study concluded that ROCKS index can identify those at low risk for HFNC failure in whom the therapy can be continued after 12 hours. So this was an adult study and the, there are no pediatric studies which have used this index. Complications. So although HFNC by and large is safe, over-reliance uh, without frequent clinical monitoring can potentially delay escalation to invasive suppose and can increase morbidity and mortality. So abdominal distension is commonly seen with HFNC and it can always be avoided by inserting nasogastric tube prior to initiation. Nasal bleeds and ulcers and blocked HFNC due to secretions and air leaks are some of the other complications. So with regards to weaning, weaning need not be a so slow process on HFNC. So once the primary indication for which HFNC has been initiated uh, is resolving and once the FiO2 requirements are stable below 40%, so we can come down on the FiO2s first, and then we can come down on flows at one liter per kg for every hour for four hours. And if the patient is stable, he can be successfully transitioned to low flow oxygen. So weaning on HFNC need not be a slow process. Uh, so whenever patient is initiated on HFNC, we generally face two dilemmas. One is with respect to feeding and second one is with respect to del, uh, aerosol therapy. With respect to feeding on HFNC, uh, there are no proper guidelines for initiation of enteral nutrition. A study by Anthony Alexander Sochet et al. Uh, on children with bronchiolitis on HFNC showed that oral nutrition was well tolerated. So another study by Shadman et al. also found oral feeding was safe and in fact, early feeding had shorter time to discharge. So it can be safely said that those patients who respond well to HFNC and uh, can be safely started on enteral nutrition two hours after the initiation of therapy, whereas uh, it is better to withhold enteral nutrition in patients who do not respond or who continue to struggle and are at risk of requiring escalation of support. With regards to aerosol therapy. So aerosol therapy via HFNC is a new approach. There is no data regarding particle depositions in lung on HFNC. So as there is lack of data, uh, we can aerosol therapy through HFNC has not been conclusively proven to deliver effectively into the lungs. Hence, we can remove the cannula and administer aerosol therapy via traditionally used interfaces like nebulizer mask. So now we will look into the evidence for HFNC use. We will look into some of the landmark trials. So first uh, is the Florally trial. Uh, this was published in NEGM in the year 2015. So this was this was a multi this was a multi-center uh, randomized control trial on 310 patients. Here HFNC was compared to standard oxygen and NIV. The primary outcome which was being studied was percentage of patients requiring intubation within 28 days. So this study concluded that there was no difference in intubation rates with respect to HFNC or standard oxygen and NIV, but there was improvement in 90 day mortality with HFNC. And the famous Paris trial. So Paris trial is pediatric acute respiratory intervention study. This was a multi-center randomized control trial. This trial studied early HFNC versus standard oxygen therapy in bronchiolitis with hypoxemia in both ED and ward settings. So this trial was basically outside the ICU settings. This trial concluded that those who received early high flow outside the ICU had significantly lower rates of escalation of care than those who received standard oxygen therapy. Some few important points to remember about Paris trial are, so Paris trial was not a trial of HFNC versus standard oxygen therapy. In fact, it's a trial of strategy of immediate HFNC for hypoxemia in bronchiolitis versus strategy of rescue HFNC when standard oxygen therapy fails. 
So the point to be noted is Paris trial does not answer about efficacy of HFNC, but tells about safety of HFNC. So another trial is hipster trial, which was basically uh, uh, conducted in preterm neonates. This was a multi-center non-inferiority randomized control trial. Preterm infants with respiratory distress were randomized either to high flow therapy or nasal CPAP. The primary outcome that was being studied was treatment failure after 72 hours. So in this trial, high flow group had higher rates of treatment failure needing escalation of support. So hipster trial concluded that HFNC is not an ideal primary mode of respiratory support in preterm infants. Another trial of reckoning is high trial. So this, tri this trial compared HFNC versus standard oxygen in immunocompromised patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure. This was a multi-center RCT. And this study concluded that there was no significant decrease in 28-day mortality on HFNC compared to standard oxygen. So all these trials which we have seen do not conclusively prove that HFNC is superior uh, either to standard oxygen or NIV. Now coming to some clinical applications with evidences. So HFNC has been studied widely in bronchiolitis. It has become the initial choice of respiratory support in children with moderate to severe acute bronchitis. There have been multiple observational studies and few randomized control trials which have conclusively proven that HFNC is associated with improvement in clinical symptoms and also reduced need for uh, escalation of respiratory support and intubation rates when compared to standard oxygen therapy in bronchiolitis. So the role of HFNC in pediatric emergency departments. So Kelly GS et al. conducted a retrospective cohort and in which they analyzed 498 children who received HFNC therapy within 24 hours of triage, 24 hours of initial triage in the emergency departments. The most common diagnosis uh, included were bronchiolitis, pneumonia, and asthma. So this study showed that HFNC failure rate was only 8%. And a diagnosis of acute bronchiolitis was protective with respect to intubation following HFNC. There was another study which showed a decreased intubation rate in pediatric emergency department from 10.5 to 2.2% in children who have been started on HFNC in view of acute respiratory insufficiency. As we have seen, one of the indications for HFNC, it is also used uh, as a weaning support from invasive mechanical ventilation. There have been studies regarding this. Uh, Hernandez G. et al. Uh, study showed that HFNC was not inferior to NIV for preventing post-extubation respiratory failure in high-risk patients and was superior to conventional oxygen in low-risk patients. Testa G. et al., uh, this was a pediatric study. Uh, this was a trial in which children comp uh, compared H. Uh, HFNC to conventional oxygen therapy in the 48 hour post extubation period after cardiac surgery. So this study proved that HFNC was safe and it improved partial pressure of oxygen though there was no effect on partial pressures of carbon dioxide. So HFNC can also be used as an adjunct in difficult airway during intubation. We all know we come across a lot of physiologically difficult airways and children are more uh, likely more likely to develop hypoxemia and have cardiac arrest during such situations. This is as a result of smaller functional residual capacities and lower uh, safe apnea time. So the THRIVE technique, it stands for transnasal humidified rapid insufflation ventilatory exchange, which is administered via HFNC to achieve apneic oxygenation, prolongs the safe apnea time and increases the margin of safety during tracheal intubation attempts and prevents sudden cardiac arrest. So this is the evidence, this is some of the evidence uh, regarding HFNC which I've covered. So majority of the trials uh, and uh, studies do not conclusively prove that HFNC is superior to other modes of non, when compared to other modes of non-invasive therapy or standard conventional oxygen therapy. So with this, I would like to conclude my talk. Uh, the take home messages of this talk are uh, so HFNC has emerged as a useful respiratory support 
to avoid intubation in conditions like bronchiolitis it can be it can be used safely for pre oxygen therapy uh, for apneic oxygenation and in physiologically difficult airways choosing correct patient is crucial for hfnc success uh, once initiated proper monitoring is essential to see for the response and also predict failure and hfnc can also be used outside icu settings in wards and emergency departments so thank you uh, thank you abhinav for a nice uh, presentation he has pointed out uh, how the hfnc works how to set up what are the indication contraindication and the, what are the evidences and uh, how to monitor a child with a uh, child on hfnc okay next uh, uh, professor dona ma'am uh, please share you. your uh, experience and uh, your comments i will thank you Uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Abel now that you've covered everything I think um I've just been quickly writing some notes down you know you've talked about the importance of the peak inspiratory demand and matching it the washout effect the peep effect um discuss the the interface and ensuring you've got the right size um that the flows um very widely um so I'll just share my screen and um Now I've got some I have got slides here that I can just whip through some of them that um may not be applicable I just wasn't sure what you may have um needed so um forgive me if I um if some of it's uh, uh, duplicated a little bit this is where I'm from in Brisbane and also at the Gold Coast uh, University Hospital a little bit further south um I'm just going to move your faces because they're in front of me um so looking i just thought i'd go through or just you've already done it as well but i just thought a couple of other additional things that i talked to you about was um high flow is actually not something new to any of us it's actually been around since 1986 and max klein studied 20 infants that had upper airway obstruction and he delivered uh, a flow a continuous insufflation insufflation flow to the pharynx of warm humidified air via a thin nasopharyngeal tube of between 2 and 10 liters per minute that relieved the obstruction and he showed that um, there was a reduced pleural uh, pressure thereby reduction in uh, work of breathing and there was 60% of the children that had a reduced respiratory rate and work of breathing with that study so it has been around for a long time and that happened in uh, South Africa and you can see also from here he uh, measures measured the esophagus pressures and you can see the big swings here is when the child is off high flow and these smaller longer ones is when they're on high flow so the top one is 3 liters and this bottom uh, graph is 10 liters so when they're off high flow they're having less work of breathing and um sorry when they're on high flow less work of breathing and as you've already alluded to the you know the three main components are oxygen flow and humidification and heat we use the evo um two devices here in australia and new zealand now you've talked about the oxygen dilution so i just want to add another component to that In 1988, Frank Shan uh, published a paper where he looked at 23 children that were less than two years of age, and he did two experiments. He did one with children um, and how much they had subnasal oxygen, and he looked at uh, the same group of children in a head box. Now he looked at how much oxygen was required subnasally to achieve saturations of 95% and 100%. He then did the same, put them in a head box. How much FiO2 was required to get sats of 95% and 100% and he plotted them against each other which you can see in the graph here. And then if you choose an arbitrary or you know, a random FiO2 such as the 50% inspired fraction in the head box it's equivalent to 150 mL per kilo per minute. So if I ask you the question of how much flow do you think or how much FiO2 would a 5 kilo baby be getting um, at 1 liter per minute? Um, some people say 30%, some say 80%, some say Um, 40% in actual fact they're receiving uh, at one liter per minute more than 70% FiO2 so it does this is just not high flow obviously just subnasal oxygen so it's very important to be mindful of how much oxygen we're, we're delivering to the child um now uh, Frey and Shan then looked in 2003 at a few different studies with head box uh, face masks nasal prongs flyby 
and um, a nasopharyngeal airway. And he was looking at uh, what produces the PEEP and he measured nine infants with a median age of 13 months post cardiac surgery with and esophageal pressures um, at end expiratory. So as you can see here, he had six to eight French gauge catheters that would pass as a nasopharyngeal um, and he was delivering 0.5 to 2 litres per minute. And you can see an 8 French, 2 litres per minute, you're already achieving 4 centimetres of PEEP. Um, so, um, it, again, it's important to note how much you're providing just with simple oxygen. Uh, now, Malaysia, he looked at 21 patients with bronchiolitis who were less than six months of age that were admitted to ICU started them on high flow at one litre and increased them in increments to four, six and seven litres per minute, giving them a 10 minute stabilisation time between each one. And he measured the uh, pressures via nasopharyngeal probe where he had um, a sensor at the uh, nostril and a sensor at the pharynx. And it showed that when you reach this flow of seven litres, um, you, you've reduced your respiratory rate and you're generating a positive pressure. The mean of these babies was about 4.3 kilos. Um, so we're already achieving this 1.6 litres per kilo per minute. And that's where we got with our Paris studies, the two litres per kilo per minute and um, at predominantly where we've sort of come from with that figure. One key item that he had with this study was ensuring the, the child's mouth, the baby's mouth was closed. So they used a pacifier and, and again, um, ensuring that you've got the right size cannula and not including more than 50%. Now, this is something we show a lot of our doctors and nurses. Um, if you've got a healthy infant, infant and looking at their inspiratory, expiratory phase. So on the healthy infant, this is their inspiratory demand and they're matching it and meeting it. The child that's sick and in respiratory distress, they have a much higher demand for um, inspiratory demand. And so if you're not actually achieving the same flow that they're requiring, they have to entrain this air. This is the orange color here. They have to entrain that air around the cannula. So if you're delivering flows of one liter per kilo per minute when it should be two, they're working harder because they're actually having to entrain that air around the nostrils to um, match some sort of inspiratory demand. Now this is, Oh, sorry, sorry. Hang on, sorry. <laughs> Didn't realize I still got a, a, just delete that, so sorry. I'll start that again. So this is um, a video that demonstrates positive pressure support or the CPAP effect. And it's basically a very simple proof of concept. And this is my husband actually under um, our, in our swimming pool with high flow. And as you can see, he's breathing quite comfortably. He was breathing um, 60 litres per minute flow is what we put on him. And he's just slowly breathing in and out up to 10 minutes. And in principle, we should be able to breathe with the right high flow rates underwater, which is shown here. And he's, uh, it's generating a form of CPAP effect. And the CPAP is basically he's got he's about 10 centimetres underwater. So he's got about a 10 centimetre um, peep that's applied. So it's essentially just a proof of concept that, um, you know, you can generate this CPAP effect if you match the inspiratory demand. Uh, so what does the cl clinician need to know when they're reviewing a patient in terms of the patient's need for oxygen versus CPAP? How does the oxygen versus the CPAP affect these children? So oxygen does have does not have a use for some of the lung diseases that we care for. If you have a child with low saturations and they need oxygen, then which part of the lung is malfunctioning and which requires CPAP and which requires oxygen? So that's important to do when you're, you're reviewing the child. Is it a function of the alveolar surface? So when there's reduced alveolar surface, which can be caused by mucus plugging, oxygen requirement can occur. And to reverse that atelectasis and consolidation in the lung, uh, the continuous positive airway pressure can fix this by reinflating the infected areas of the lung. Is it a function of shunt fraction? So improving shunt fraction, um, there's a you know, percentage of the blood circulating out by the heart that bypasses functioning alveoli, which are not completely oxygenated. And we know CPAP can fix this. Is it a function of the ventilation inhomogeneity? So poor ventilation in inhomogeneity. This is when you know, the lungs, part of the lung is ventilated as well as other parts or may even be block causing maldistribution, for example, in pneumonia. And CPAP can fix this one. 
or is it a function of alveolar capillary membrane? So swelling alveolar capillary membrane, which is thickened due to the inflammation and secretions and oxygen diffuses poorly and less oxygen is taken up into the blood, increasing the fractional concentration of the inspired oxygen. It will improve this. So the first three respond to CPAP and the last one responds to oxygen. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize I haven't deleted um, one of my previous slides. Apologies for this. Um, now transfers, what we ha we have a very big state in Australia and um, that we sometimes have to travel up to 3000 kilometers uh, to get some of the sick children so that we do transport them on um, high flow. Uh, we have, uh, in the past we've used the Venturi system, uh, but now we've actually got the Hamilton ventilator which are able to achieve the same. Oh, it's happening again, sorry, I'm so sorry. I thought I deleted all of these. Um, I just wanted to show you that we did a, um, a paper in 2009 when we looked at the retrievals that we reviewed all the children under two years of age who were um, transferred because we were highly criticized for doing transfers on infants with using high flows, people believe that the child should be intubated when they um, or they were going to be intubated post us transferring them to the tertiary facility. But as you can see from this graph, as the years go by 2009 up to 2012, the white areas high flows so were actually increasing in high flow and decreasing in intubation. And our intubation rates are closer to three to 5% in the bronchiolitis infants in particular. Now, and in 2014, which uh, we've already um, shown the Mayfield study, which basically showed early use of high flow um, that we com commenced in the emergency department and could transfer those children to the peed ward, that um, we demonstrated a reduction in transfer rate of two and a half fold in PICU. And we're also able to show the responders and non-responders. So again, uh, it's a bit repetitive of what you've already shown that within one to two hours, the heart rate decreases and the respiratory rate has decreased. So the three studies that we've now done um, in recent years, Paris 1 was across 17 centres um, and Paris 2 pilot was two and Paris uh, 2 large RCT across 14 centres. So with the, um, the first study was the bronchiolitis infants, uh, less than 12 months of age and uh, with an oxygen requirement. Paris 2 pilot, we just did in the two centers and we looked at all age groups up to 16 years of age with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure and an oxygen requirement. And the large RCT, which we just completed and we're cleaning the data at the moment, we've done on the one to four year age group. And um, you can see the, the sample sizes that we've got at the bottom there. Some, a key component to what we've done with our flows, because I know we've already alluded to that they vary widely. We stick to these flows. Now remember, these are the ones that we use for children in the emergency department and the ward. So we never go below two liters per kilo per minute because we know that that is gonna match their inspiratory demand. I know that there's studies out there that show that they drop them to one liter and you've already alluded to the fact that you uh, will wean their flows. We do not wean the flows. So the children, these, as I say, these are the emergency department, uh, mild to moderate severity and the children that go to the ward. Uh, the children that go to intensive care will, it will increase the flows up on top of these flows and going up to 60 liters per minute but we will always drop them only to this point for those weight categories and we won't go below them. So all we'll do is wean the FI at two, but never the flows lower than this. So we always know that we're matching the inspiratory demand. And the flow rates are worked out on the minute volume. So we know that the lung growth is not linear to the body length and weight, and it tailors off after about four years of age. Uh, the Paris one, as you've already said, it, it was looking at reducing the requirement of escalation of therapy and it basically um, showed the safety profile of um, using high flow outside the intensive care unit. Uh, I'll just slip through this one. So we had the 1,472 patients that we ended up including in an analysis out of almost 21,000 children that we screened across 17 centres. Oh, out of the two groups, standard oxygen and high flow, there were equally distributed, just over 730 children each. And in the high flow, uh, uh, in the high flow arm, 87 did not, um, 87 did not respond to therapy and in the standard oxygen, 167. So we had a 23 versus 12% um, uh, difference. And it shows a positive result in that if you use high flow earlier than standard oxygen, that you're less likely to escalate. 
uh, some of the key points from that study was there's an 11% risk difference um, that uh, uh, we saw between the two groups. So we know the number to treat is nine um, to avoid one intensive care admission. Our regional centres, which we had nine out of the 17 centres, actually performed better than the tertiary centres. And it was because they didn't have on-site ICUs, they held on to the children a little bit longer and then the children actually ended up improving and doing better. So they actually did very well. Secondary outcomes showed that there was no difference in um, or significance in the length of stay or ICU days, or oxygen days. And there was an adverse event in both each of the arms, which was a pneumothorax, but it was disease related rather than high flow related. And importantly, out of 1,512 infants, we only had 12 infants, so 0.8% that were intubated. And as I say, our intubation rate for bronchial is about three percent now so for the study in a controlled protocol driven way we were able to reduce that even more with our pilot study remember the zero to 16 year old with a um, that are hypoxic with a respiratory um, illness we we're looking at the feasibility and efficacy of the high flow with these children uh, again we're using those same flows and um, it was performed at the Queensland Children's Hospital in Brisbane and Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. Now, we're out of just over 12,000 children that we screened, uh, 563 were included in the analysis with the standard oxygen children uh, requiring 18% were requiring escalation and on the high flow, 11% requiring um, escalation. So, the key outcomes of this was the feasibility and efficacy tested that yes, it is safe on the, on the ward and ED for these older children um, and that we need a large RCT and the new RCT, we're now targeting the new age group of one to less than five years and we're stratifying obstructive to non-obstructive with a primary outcome of hospital length of stay. So this is the study we've just completed and we're now writing, uh, we're now cleaning the data and we're looking at a reduction in hospital length of stay. Uh, that's pretty much what I've said. Um, other key aspects, I just thought I'd add a bit more to the nasogastric tube. So we basically say it's at the discretion of the, the treating clinician. Uh, we encourage it in the less than 12 months of age to support the venting of the stomach. Uh, but in the older age group, honestly, it was not needed. These children, because they're mild to moderate severity uh, that come through emergency and for the peds ward, they, and even some of the children in intensive care, we not needed to put that in because they're able to sit up, belch and get rid of their air and they can, um, uh, they're safe with their airway. So it would only really put them in the older children if they needed hydration. Nebulizers or aerosols. So we, similar to what you've already said, we remove the actual high flow, give them the nebulizer, and then once finished, we put it back on. Otherwise it's just the, uh, the disposition is, is not where it should be. And it's the medicine's just sitting at the back of the pharynx spinning around. Um, I guess one key thing we've learned with all of our studies um, is that it's so important to have a clear guideline that doesn't just work for your hospital, but it's one that works across many hospitals, all the ones that transfer in, also talks to your transfer transport department because they need to know what flows you're giving, how you manage these children. So when you all escalate, you all escalate at the same um, place um, and it's not sort of variable every way and so you you do need to know you know what age group are you targeting what cohort cohort and severe uh, disease severity so we're now we've kind of covered a lot of them now so we've incorporated that into one guideline and which departments are able to be part of of that um, guideline what equipment and barriers you have with equipment with the battery backup and so on and also obviously um I mean, we've got to get the executive people on board because we found some of our hospitals had some difficulties with some executive who would not let them put high flow on in a particular ward. So you have to get around that. So you include all your stakeholders and including obviously ICU, NED and the wards. Um, so Donna, just, can we please uh, shorten it a bit? We have to take up a bit of questions. Sorry. Yep, sure. No, no, no. I thought that was pretty much the end because all the rest of it, um, that's fine. Have I unshared? Yeah, Dr. Muthu, can you please proceed okay. with the questions? Muthu, Dr. Muthu? We are not able to hear you. Please un unmute yourself. Uh, um, is there any, contra any contraindication for HFNC in pneumothorax or other air leak syndrome? Uh, 
Um, I can talk to that. There's not with the practice that we've had, um, no. And as I said, we've had two pneumothoraxes with the Paris One study, but that was um, related to the disease, not the high flow, and we've not had other problems. So that's in our experience. Okay, ma'am. Uh, can we use oxygen cannulas for HFNC with traditional blenders, especially in uh, resource limited settings? Because here, one uh, uh, the circuit cost is some three thousand or four thousand rupees. Can you use oxygen yep. cannula with traditional blender and humidifier? Um, I, well, we used before Evo came about. We actually used to use the blender, so that's what we used probably for eight years, I'd say. So that's what was the setup in now intensive care was um, and it but it was still with a cannula that is a bit regular cannula so, and because remember there and um, so you want that soft flexibility there you don't add one that's sitting in there with, with a really much higher flows but I would still use low cannula what is the maximum flow that can be safely delivered, especially in children with obese uh, adolescents? What is the maximum flow that can be uh, given in obese children? Uh, is there? Yes, sir. Do you want me? Usually, uh, the flow is two liters per kg per minute. And yes, the maximum is three liters per kg per minute. It's what we deliver, not more than it that. is two liter per kg per minute. It's a traditional teaching, but in obese, they have obese adolescents, especially this. Yeah, Already there are, no uh, each, there, are no there are no guidelines. Each cannula have a, it, it is specified in the cannula, the package inset. For each cannula size, we have some uh, maximum peak that flow rate that can be given, like that get mentioned. So we can choose the appropriate cannula and see the package inset in that and we can do like that. Um, We've, um, I can add to that, when we were doing the Paris One study, so they're less than 12 months of age, we had some very big babies that were 14 kilos and 10 months of age, for instance. So we would only max them at 25 litres per minute and not go above that for the less than 12 months of age. But the children, as they get older, we actually would max them out and put them higher, higher. So it was just the smaller ones that we were a bit more careful. Okay. Um... How to wean uh, a child from HFNC? Uh, do we decrease the first flow or FiO2? And um, how do we wean? Weaning from HFNC. So I'll take that. Uh, ah, yes, we, uh, weaning on HFNC uh, need not be an extensive process. So once uh, we are sure that the clinical I mean, the clinical condition is improving and the FiO2 levels are stable, that is less than uh, 50% or 40%, so we can first come down on FIO2s. Once we are uh, on FIO2 of less than 40% or 30% maybe, then we can come down on the flows uh, every hour by one liter per kg per minute. Mm -hmm. And over next four hours, uh, if there is uh, no worse, and even while weaning, we need to monitor. So if there is uh, no further, if the child is stable on weaning, then I think we can safely transition to low flow oxygen. So first FIO2s followed by flows. Flow. Okay. 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 Uh, is there any risk for uh, of uh, auto peep, uh, especially in asthma or bronchiolitis child while using uh, HFNC? Usually we don't prefer to start HFNC in asthma patients. Uh, so like because one problem what we routinely face is nebulizations, like frequent disconnection for nebulizations. Nebulizations. Yes, sir. Or, bronchial asthma. The other thing is the, uh, like, for example, they do tolerate a simple flow with nebulization. If they go in for a respiratory failure, uh, the routine practice here is to use a BiPAP. So uh, can, uh, Professor Donna can share her experience of using HFNC in uh, asthma. In bronchiolitis, obviously, we, we all bronchiolitis, they do have ad trapping. We do start HFNC and we find very good response in bronchiolitis. We uh, used it for the Paris 2 pilot study um, with the asthmatics and also now with the, the large RCT. I can't give you the answer with the, the large one because we haven't got the, the results to that yet. Um, but they they tolerated it, the asthmatics. I think 
from a nursing perspective, it did take us longer to get that child more comfortable with it. And so we would start them on a lower flows and slowly over about five minutes, just tweak their um, flows up but we didn't have any we've had no adverse events from an asthmatic perspective with the pilot study and that was 560 children and we've had none with the 1500 kids for the the second one uh, i have one question then what is the can we use for hfnc for uh, uh, upper airway obstruction maybe especially like croup or um, upper airway obstruction in Uh, so croup, we we did not use that. We didn't do it for the first study because it was just the, the bronchiolitis. But we did have a few croup children um, sneak in there in the study in the end. But uh, we had no problems with with them having high flow. You, you could use it, but we haven't really had that indication uh, for use with with croup. So and we didn't put them into the second study either. Okay, then most of the questions are answered. Um, can we use uh, HFNC cannula after abdominal surgery? Abdominal surgery. No. Post op setting after mainly the abdominal surgery they asked. Better not to use. With, I think, I think no, we shouldn't be using. They, they're doing, um, I don't know if you've heard of the hamster trial. So the protocol's out now. And that's the study one of our anaesthetists has been performing essentially like Thrive, which you, you've talked about today already, but um, the apneic oxygenation. Uh, and so during induction, they uh, they, they uh, bag mask the child up to 100%. Then they put a nasal high flow on and they put them at the flows that I was showing you earlier. And uh, then if you have a look at her, uh, what, she's got a couple of papers out, Susan Humphreys is her name, and uh, she was able to show in different age groups, um, at, they did it on a t a ENT surgery, so very small, short, uh, not complex surgeries, and was able to show that you could just use high flow only and the child did not need to be intubated. So they broke it up into age groups. Obviously the smaller ones, less than six months, were only able to do it for a few minutes and then, and, and the older ones had it for a little bit longer. So we're now doing a study uh, similar to that, but on with bronchoscopies. So um, it's gonna take a little bit longer. So it is happening, but it's just much smaller um, surgery and uh, elective surgery only. Uh, one participant asked HFNC, use of HFNC in heart failure in small infants, heart failure, heart failure. Yeah, yeah HFNC can be used safely. In heart failure, particularly in reducing the afterthought by providing a positive airway pressure. So uh, it's, it's, and it is very comfortable. The child won't become agitated, anxious, yeah. as compared to a, a nasal CPAP. So if there is a availability of HFNC, you can consider HFNC, provided the child needs to be, uh, it should, the child should not be in a cardiogenic shock. That is one important thing. It should be a cardiac failure is okay, but cardiogenic shock requiring uh, excessive inotropic support, it is better to uh, so some for initial, initial management we can use uh, Right. Initial mild cases in severe cases better to avoid because the the amount of positive pressure it is unpredictable depending upon various factors including the mouth breathing and mouth opening mouth opened or closed so in severe cases better to use either NIV or other advanced mode uh, that's all uh, we have answered almost all questions um, Dr Nikhil. Yeah, there is a question that can we use single nares as interface for HFNC? Oh, yes, can we use single nares as interface for HFNC? <laughs> I have not used it. I have, <laughs> no, I have never I don't seen think it. so. <laughs> no, unless you have one nostril. <laughs> what is the difference between HFNC and CPAP? That main difference between HFNC and CPAP? I think the main difference uh, is with respect to the amount of uh, positive uh, airway pressures delivered. Yes. So the uh, exact amount of pressures delivered by HFNC, I mean, uh, we are not sure. So basically, it delivers flow. So the pressure it is, is not sure how much it will be delivered. 
so that is the main difference see pep it is giving pressure mainly so they're waiting for the yeah. results of paris 2 of starting yeah. <laughs> for uh, any acute hypoxemic respiratory failure Yeah. Because the current concepts are the evidence are more pro for a bronchiolitis, whereas uh, evidence for pneumonia, uh, uh, a bacterial yeah. or a pneumonia, where the FRC mm-hmm. is drastically reduced, how effective the HFNC is in opening collapsed alveoli yeah. in such children is still questionable. Uh, the traditional yes. teaching is if you have to improve the FRC, better to go with uh, a CPAP or a BiPAP in children with. Uh, yeah. Pneumonia as a cause of hypoxemic respiratory failure. Yeah, so, I do know that um, from the pilot study as well. That, you know, most of it's we have more obstructive than non-obstructive um, cases. It's the same happen. Like I could see that with the stratification of the Paris to larger RCT. So, you know, we'll have more more information from a pneumonia point of view than the asthmatic, I guess, the reactive yeah. airways. Uh, there is a question uh, that how can we manage if the patient keeps his mouth open? This common problem, especially in small infants, now they it's difficult to always close that. For a baby, a pacifier is the yeah, is an easy thing. Pacifier. Yeah. Is there an absolute contraindication to HFNC? Yes, yeah, severe hemodynamic instability. Mm-hmm. We can't use HFNC. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. ENT surgery is it's an alternative contraindication. I don't use it. ENT. There are many alternative contraindications. I don't think we we can use it in ENT surgery. Right. No, we don't use it in craniofacial malformations or you know that type of surgery as well. Yeah. I think we have answered most of the questions. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, For nebulizing, you still remove HFNC and you do nebulization. Or recently, Fisher and Packel they had uh, bought an adapter uh, which yeah, can do that, nebulization. What do you it, prefer for nebulizing in uh, patients? Yeah, I, I know the Fisher and Packel. I know what you're talking about with that. We that's not hasn't been clinically proven that disposition gets right to where we want it to get to. So that's why we're not sold on that. Part of the product as yet until a proper clinical trial is shown. So that's why we say, remove. Oh, uh, the the beauty of the. Uh, uh, oh, it's not. So, you can remove the cannula. So we do say that because the beauty of them is that they're velcroed on, so you can take them on and off, and um, then uh, apply the nebulizer and then put them back to their high flow in the right settings. I, I'm not sure if in India they have. Uh, one thing i saw when you had the the picture of the different cannula up there you still got the bird and the butterfly pictures all the critters as they call them have changed and they've got new they've got optiflow junior 2 plus and there's one cannula that we've now we helped them build this with their engineers and it's in place now here in australia and new zealand particularly and it's called the dolphin cannula and it's a gray color but it actually fits that child it's after the green one or the, the purple green so you, you talked about the neonates and it's the purple green then And it's the one that suits that one to four, five, six-year-old group. So those asthmatics, reactive airways, and so on, it perfectly fits them. It's got wiggle pads. It's nice and easy to pull on and off because of the velcro. So I don't know if you can get that or not in India, but um, they honestly they have been so much more helpful. Otherwise, you end up having to put the adult cannula on those children, and that's a nightmare because you have to put tape everywhere, and it's horrible. So if you can get that, that is much better because. depending on the size of the child we've used them up to an 8 9 year old even in icu um one other thing just before i forget i'm just looking at one of the other questions here with flows a uh, study that we're doing right now in our icu is a dose finding trial so on bronchiolitis less than 12 months of age what we're doing is a- applying anywhere from 0.5 randomly 0.5 liters per kilo up to 3 liters per kilo and we're using at through eit and actually monitoring um what the muscle and what work of breathing and effort they're doing and giving them a rest between each of 10 minutes on 10 minutes off 10 minutes on and so on and so we're going to try and find the sweet spot if you could call it that what is the right amount of flow for a severe bronchiolitis infant in intensive care um we've we've done the study on the neonates but uh yeah we're still probably halfway through with the the children okay thank you 
thank you thank you so much for an interesting session uh, to all of you uh, dr karthik narayan sir do you want to add something from an indian perspective mm. see usually what we face is um, uh, like we don't start uh, still the practice of starting hypronasal cannula in emergencies has not it been uh, practiced in india we still start hypronasal cannulas in pacus so hypronasal cannula as a substitution to early oxygen therapy it still uh, requires more awareness and most important factor for us is the cost the costing yeah. of the circuit and the uh, cost to the patient is very high in a private sector in government sector the resources the availability of the amount of circuits and the requirement so these are two pro uh, most uh, uh, like for example it impedes us to uh, have an effective use of high flow nasal cannula eventually we use it as a rescue therapy or uh, once the oxygen therapy fails we start high flow nasal cannula so that process of starting an early high flow nasal cannula as a uh, as a surrogate or just a similar to a standard oxygen therapy has to start in our country and second thing is usage of uh, high flow nasal cannula for non bronchiolitis indications uh, still we uh, we do require more studies in our setting because here mostly we get children who land up late to our emergencies rather than early so the efficiency of hypronasal cannula for such situations in acute hypoxemic respiratory failure we were we would not be able to extrapolate the results of paris 2 to our setting so we have to have our own evidence being generated uh, to proceed further regarding that as Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm immensely thankful to Professor Dona, uh, who has taken out her uh, uh, precious time. And uh, late in the evening, uh, she is with us, uh, which is which is she has gone beyond uh, beyond the norm. Oh. I'm so thank you for inviting me. Yeah, <laughs> most thankful, and we are so sorry that we had to sort of uh, shoot no, the so door. good, door. so good. I would like to take this opportunity to invite you for another complete session with us <laughs> at a later date. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, sure. I think there is much more to learn. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. Abhinav who has given a very nice talk in a very small amount of time. Uh, I think this is one of the best talks we have had so far. Uh, and Dr. Muthu for a wonderful mod moderation and Dr. Karthik Narayanan for joining us and sharing his Indian uh, view on HFNC. Thank you all. We end here. And uh, last but not the least, I thank to all our participants who have been joining us and who have been asking so many questions and making this session so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.